do, let's dive into the phones. Mike in Virginia has been waiting. Thank you, Mike, for your patience. You're first up. What's going on today, Mike? Hello. An explosive, Ed. Nice to talk to you, fellas. Thank you. Thanks for listening. You got it, man. About a month ago, I went to see uh, Greta down in Raleigh, North Carolina. It was uh, at their amphitheater. It had about 6,000 people there. The band sounded fantastic. It was a really, really nice evening for about the first hour. And then it started to be a little bit tedious because the band would have, and I'm not exaggerating, guys, probably five or six of the uh, dozen songs they played there were vocal acrobatics that would open the songs or extend the songs or guitar solos. And I was just thinking, if these guys had put together a really tight one-hour set opening for somebody like Whitesnake, that would have left me wanting more. I couldn't have waited for the next tour. But as it was, I was looking at my watch because they were out there 90 minutes, and it was it just seemed bloated instead of tight and lean. And I wanted to know what your thoughts were, if that would be a good bill, Greta and Whitesnake, and what you think that would do business-wise. Mike, the problem there is a couple things. First of all, and thank you for the call, first of all, Whitesnake, Greta Van Fleet is not going to open for Whitesnake because right now Greta Van Fleet is a far bigger band in America. I mean, do they have the history of Whitesnake? Of course not. But are they by far a bigger band right now? Yes. And uh, that's all with all respect to Whitesnake, but that's just calling it like it is. Greta Van Fleet is a young, active band getting played on radio all over the country uh, on on current rock stations. Whitesnake is not. So that is not going to happen. The other thing is this. Most young emerging bands don't want association with older bands. They don't want it. They want to stay in their demographic. They don't like the way it looks, the imaging, their managers, their reps. They will discourage them from doing that. They will not want that sort of association. They would rather tour with a band of their age and that is hip and current and happening than with a band that has a 40, 50-year history. There's only one band that I can think of off the top of my head that embraces touring with older, significantly older artists, and that's Hailstorm. They're doing it this summer going out with Alice Cooper. In the past, Hailstorm has toured with Lita Ford. That's highly unusual. Because most bands are worried too much or their management is worried too much about the imaging of that and how it looks and how it positions them and paints them. So something like that, in theory, although musically I can understand where you're coming from, in reality, very unlikely to ever happen. Now, your point about Greta not having enough content to fill out a full headlining set I can understand that. I've again, I've yet to see that band live, so I'm not sure what they're doing. But you know, and I don't know if doing extended guitar stuff or vocal acrobatics is there because it fills time, or just because that's what they want to do. I think it's probably more the latter. I think that's probably more the way they feel they want to perform live right now. But when you guys think about these bills that you want to put together, you've got to take a step back and realize the incredible level of, you know, there's politics involved, there's ego involved, there's billing involved, there's money involved. But the other thing about it is the optics. What does it look like? You know, do we want an association with that artist? It's not, and it's not whether the artist is good or not. It's whether it's, you know, if you're a young up and coming band, you want to be the young, you want to be in the un, young and up and coming circles. You don't want to tie your wagon to uh, what is essentially a classic heritage act. A lot of that sort of discussion goes on. Trust me. Hell, I think I got, I, I've told you guys this before. When when I was doing that metal show, and I personally booked 
probably 90% of the acts you ever saw on that show. I would often hear from managers, and they'd ask me, well, who are the other bands going to be? Because we had multiple guests in almost every episode. Who are the other bands going to be? Who, the, who else is going to be in the show? Because a lot of times they were worried about, oh, I don't want my guy sitting next to somebody. You know, if it's a young band, I don't want my guy sitting next to an old guy. Or, But that was the charm of the show. That was one of the fun things we did. I love doing that sort of stuff. The artists generally don't care. But the handlers are always worried about how that looks for their artist. Because that, that but, girl did a but, good job. Hey, Eddie good in job. Westchester. Eddie. Uh-oh. Hey, man, Eddie, you're finally on. Oh, sorry to interrupt your conversation, Eddie, but you're on my show now. So go ahead, Eddie. You're finally on the air. All right. A couple of questions. First of all, I saw you in the commercial for Sammy Hagar. When is that episode uh, coming on? The Sammy Hagar I'm in the show. commercial? What is it, on Access TV you saw it? Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. I haven't even seen the commercial yet, but the the new season of my TV show, Trunk Fest on Access TV, debuts on July 7th at 9.30 Eastern, 6.30 Pacific. It'll be on every Sunday night starting July 7th at 9.30 Eastern on Access, and the very first episode will be from Sammy Hagar's High Tide Beach Party from last year, so that's probably the commercial you're seeing. Right. Well, it looks like a Sammy Hagar commercial, but that's all right. I got a couple, uh, one quest, couple questions for you. Eddie Van Halen, right? Who would you put the top three guitars that sound like him the most? Because I'm always looking for that. And the only one that ever came close to me was Vito Brado of uh, White Lion. And I don't know where he is and what he's doing now or if White Lion is even uh, touring. But that kind of music, that rat those guys really can't find a festival that's like that. It's usually a little bit too heavy. I was wondering a festival? Well, well, hold on, Eddie. You mean a fest? What do you mean a festival? Well, I'm looking for the. I used to go to Ozfest, and it was a little bit too heavy for me. And now there's nothing really around the tri-state area where I'm living in Rockland, and well, I'm looking for like a good. Well, well, there's M3. M3 in Maryland has gone on for like 10 years. All that is is 80s hard rock. Oh, that's too far away. <laughs> well, Eddie, you're not, Eddie, you're not going to get it in your backyard, Eddie. What do you want to set up on your front lawn and do an 80s festival? No, within two, within two hours away, Trunk, within two hours away. Come on, get on the Acela. Get on the Acela. You'll be down there at BWI in Two hours or less. Dude, if I can't take Metro oh. North, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> All right, let me let me throw one more at you. This Wolfgang, uh, Wolfgang is on Valerie Bertinelli's show the other day, talking about his new album coming out soon, but no date. Any news on it? Any uh, any no. Uh, information? No, I heard. Thank you, Eddie, for the call. I'll let Eddie get back to his other conversation. Um, I, I heard Wolfgang was on his mom's TV show, and to me... The problem with releasing Wolfgang Van Halen's record is directly tied to Van Halen. Because if he is going to go out and tour and promote a record to have a chance at people knowing about it, he's going to have to do press. And God forbid anybody in Van Halen or with the last name Van Halen speaks about what's going on or not going on with Van Halen. So to me, I think it's probably tied to the fact that whatever is going on or not happening with Van Halen, you know, this this kid goes out and tries to sell a record and does interviews, he's going to be asked about it. I also just read where I think it's Clint Lowry from Seven Dust, he's going to guest on that record. I think he's doing a lot of things just to try to keep busy until he knows if the gag order is off and he can go out and talk and work a record. And my theory consistently has been which I think would be brilliant, is if Van Allen ever goes out and does anything, and the rumors are true that they would bring back Michael Anthony, have Wolfgang open the shows. It's perfect. But, of course, Van Halen would need to tour to do that, and we don't know what's happening. So I have no idea what's going on with that, but that record seemingly has been done for a long time, but remember, from what we know, Wolfgang Van Halen is still in Van Halen. So if he's going to go out and sell a solo record, that's going to change some things, and he's going to have to talk a little bit about that because 
nobody in their right mind interviewing him wouldn't ask about that. And that seems to be the uh, a massive mystery at this moment. And to f- to, uh, further to Eddie's point, I mean, there are 80s-themed rock festivals out there. There's not a lot of them because, quite frankly, those bands that all would play them tour constantly. They play clubs every night of the week somewhere. And lo- a lot of those festivals themed with that are not, Honestly, they're not a huge draw. If they were, there would be more of them. But if you were looking for bands and events of that caliber, you've got M3 and you've got the Monsters of Rock Cruise. Now, something tells me if Eddie's not willing to drive three or four hours, he maybe he's not willing to get on a ship and fly to Florida. <laughs> Eddie wanted... uh you know, White Lion reunion setting up in his backyard there. And by the way, White Lion is completely inactive. Vito Brada has not been in music in 25 years. But you were right, it's the Eddie Van Halen-ish playing. But the other guy I'd point to, who I think is definitely a descendant of Eddie and captures that same sort of fire and excitement in his playing from that era, is absolutely Nuno Betancourt. You've got to listen to Extreme and Nuno if you haven't already because the guy's a monster and is very much cut from that cloth. So that would be another guy I would give Eddie to to check out for sure. Thank you for the call, Eddie. This is Tim, who's in Florida on Trunk Nation. Welcome, Tim. So many people say Jimmy Hicks was the greatest guitarist ever. Um, Is that your opinion? Hmm. Do I think a lot of guitar questions today? Thank you, Tim, for the call. Do I think Jimi Hendrix is the greatest guitar player ever? Technically, probably not. You know, from a a technical studied standpoint, probably not. Uh, The most groundbreaking, the most influential in rock, probably. Obviously, Jimmy Page would be up there for a lot of people. Eric Clapton would be up there for a lot of people. Eddie Van Halen would be up there for a lot of people. But I think when people trace the lineage of the great guitar players, inevitably it leads back to, certainly in rock and hard rock, leads back to Hendrix. Just like when you trace back any music in any genre, ultimately it leads back to the Beatles. Let's say hello to Jay, who's listening in Texas. What's going on, Jay? How's it going, Eddie? Great, man. Yeah, I don't know if you heard recently, but uh, the River City Rock Fest uh, was canceled due to the lack of securing top-tier talents. And uh, it just surprises me because San Antonio is a big rock city. I'm surprised you haven't been to San Antonio, man. We got the Riverwalk, man. Come on. I, t- You know, man, I've heard forever what a great city San Antonio is for rock. And I have, you're right. I've never been there, and I would love to visit. I, I just, shockingly, I've not been given an offer, an opportunity to do anything there. I mean, been to Dallas, Houston. I'm going to Austin tomorrow. Been so many cities there, but I've never been to San Antonio. But, Jay, tell me, what was the River City Rock Fest? I don't know what it was. Who was playing it? What was what was it announced as? Oh, wow, man. Um, it's been uh, – this is supposed to be the seventh year of the, of, the rock, of the Rock Fest. And, I mean, the first year, the headliners were Kid Rock and Five Finger Death Crunch. I mean, your buzzword has been the experience of music festivals, and this was a pure hard rock metal festival no bullshit rap no arts and crafts shit if you didn't mind paying ten dollars for a beer then you're good if you can stand the texas heat you're fine but it was pure i mean we've had Def leopard megadeth godsmack uh you know uh hell yeah you name it i mean it's purely a hard rock music fest and so what what jay what, what was it announced what was the lineup announced for this year did they announce bands well, that's the thing. It first came out Leonard Skinner, which we thought they were done, but I guess not. 
Um, and then we never heard anything. We were like, damn, when are they going to announce it? And they never did. And come to find out, they couldn't secure top talent. And I'm thinking, do you think we were a victim of all this influx of music festivals? Because it before it had been the weekend of Memorial Day weekend, so it was competing with Rocklahoma. But this mm-hmm. year, uh, because of the damn heat and 103 degree temperature, they moved it to, it had grown to, uh, it was going to be a two day festival this year and they couldn't get the talent. And DIN is one of the promoters of it. And I, I don't know if it was a money situation and they're just saying, oh, well, we couldn't secure the talent, but it seems to me the acts that have been performing here in the past, it just seems to me like they would want to play here or, I mean, I don't know. I just, it's kind of, kind of bummed about but, it. But know? just just to, just so I'm clear on this, Jay, the show never yeah. actually went on sale and they never announced bands? Right. The tickets the tickets never went on sale because we, they had been delayed because usually the the band lineup is announced by now. Usually it's around uh, uh, around the beginning of May, middle of May, and they just announced it about four weeks ago that uh, it's going to be can- canceled this year, but they're going to come back next year as a two day mm. festival because they couldn't secure top tier talent. Yeah. I mean, the, the, well, Jay, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, thank you for the call, Jay. And I would, I honestly, I would love to come to San Antonio for something one of these days and, and visit there. Cause I have heard for decades what a great rock city it is, but, uh, I, I don't know. I've heard now that you mentioned that festival and it being the same weekend as Rocklahoma, it does strike a little bit of a chord in my memory because I do Rocklahoma every year and I do remember hearing that. I, I remember over the years I would talk to bands that would, would play Rocklahoma, say, on Saturday, and I'd be like, where are you guys tomorrow? And they're like, oh, we're driving to San Antonio tonight. We're playing another festival the next day. Because that's how it works a lot with these festivals. They kind of route them. So they'll they'll hit okay we're doing a festival in Kansas City on Friday we're playing a Tulsa festival on Saturday and then on Sunday we're in San Antonio and they just do a sweep the same bands that's why you see so many of the same bands on so many of the same rock festivals because they package them all up and i think that is part of the problem honestly with rock festivals because rock festivals the idea behind it is that they are destinations, that they are, like, that's the only place or a city you can go to the one time a year where you can see that combination of bands. And it's not like that anymore. It's the furthest thing from it. Now, instead of having one or two rock festivals, wherever they are in the country, where you just got to get there because there's no way you're seeing that mix of bands or a similar mix of bands anywhere else, now you can conceivably see a mix of bands like that every weekend somewhere, especially you know maybe through May and June, because they're, they're routing it and the promoters are buying stuff in bundles, so that becomes a problem too, and that becomes you know takes away some of the uniqueness and some of the excitement. When it's like, okay, well, if I don't go to it in Kansas City, I can go to it in San Antonio. Now, granted, that's a decent distance away, but you know what I'm saying. I just mentioned before, Rob Zombie is on, like, every one of these festivals. And then we'll go and tour on his own. Corn, you we've seen them on so many of these festivals. There are those bands that do a lot, so it's hard to change it up. It's hard to reinvent it. It's hard to keep people's interest, which is why, and our caller brought the term up, the experience thing has become such a big deal. Because the pool of talent that these festivals can pull from kind of remains the same. How do you turn it over? How do you reinvent it? How do you make it different? How do you make it appealing? How do you make it stand out? The people come to you versus the one they could go to the next weekend that's kind of similar a couple hours away. So the next 10 years, I think, are going to be really, really interesting to see what goes on with all these music festivals and which ones sink and swim and reinvent themselves. And that's another reason why 
And even though I don't like it, and clearly our caller doesn't either, that's another reason why you're seeing the diversity in the lineup where all of a sudden some rap and EDM-flavored acts are starting to show up on rock festivals. They're trying to differentiate, and they can't go the next level with talent because it will kill their budget. 